Okay, so before I start, um, who I am, uh, I work on HDFS and some related storage technologies at Cloudera, so big data stuff, pretty much. Um, I'm a committer on Hadoop. Previously, I worked on the, uh, the Ceph distributed file system. So, HTrace is a new Apache project to do distributed tracing. And I guess let me explain a little bit about what distributed tracing means to us. So, <clears throat> you know, I mean, you guys have touched on this a little bit earlier, um, but just to be, you know, complete, distributed tracing is when you follow specific requests across the entire cluster. Um, for us, distributed tracing means not only distributed in terms of uh, different nodes, different uh, computers, but also different projects. So we'd like to be able to follow tracing all the way down the storage stack and not just stop at the edge of the project boundary. <clears throat> um, so why do it? I mean, it, it's kind of hard, so why are we bothering? Um, it's important because diagnosing distributed performance is actually really difficult for us. Um, it's just a persistent problem uh, in real distributed systems because you have very many uh, timeouts and you have fallbacks. Um, these systems are architected to be robust against um, any kind of signal node failure. So uh, oftentimes, what you get is just bad performance instead. And having the timeout, having the fallbacks actually makes it harder to diagnose these kind of performance problems. Performance problems are also often not very repeatable. So, I mean, when you've got a cluster with 50 nodes, and each node has a hundred, has uh, 10 disks. That's already like <clears throat> 500 disks you're dealing with, and if one of them is bad, the odds that you're just going to randomly know that is pretty low. So, <clears throat> I mean, um, just to consider a, a very simple example, if you had HBase plus HDFS, uh, I, I'm not going to go into details of. Uh, the deep details of HDFS here, but you can see that there's already like um, six different nodes involved here. There's the client node, there is um, <clears throat> the name node, storing metadata, there are three different data nodes storing data. Um, so yeah, there's five nodes and six different pieces of code here. So this is just doing something really simple, right? So you can picture that if one of these things is being slow, it's not very easy to find out why. Um, some real world scenarios we have are, you know, the cluster is running slow. Why is that happening? Um, is it worthwhile to spend time optimizing some particular piece of code or some function? Um, why was the cluster slow over the weekend? We get this a lot. Um, <clears throat> what project has a performance problem? And you know, what's really going on in the log messages. So it's, <clears throat> for example, if you see a bunch of EOF exceptions in the log, is that really a problem? Or is it just kind of um, routine? So some previous approaches that we've done and that we continue to do, um, log4j is certainly very important. Um, it's nice to log things that are slow. Uh, for example, if it took a very long time to do an F-sync, you probably want to log that. Um, but there's all kinds of problems with this sort of approach. One problem is that you're setting an arbitrary threshold for slowness. And whatever it is, it's not going to satisfy everybody. And even if it does, um, even if you somehow were able to achieve a threshold and satisfy everybody, logging still makes things slower, especially when something's happening quite a great deal, which it often does. Um, <clears throat> log messages lose the request context for many reasons. Um, because typically distributed systems will have multiple layers of abstraction. At the very top layer, you might be doing a SQL query, a distributed SQL query. But down at the bottom layer, you're just writing bytes. In the middle, you might be dealing with block files, or you might be dealing with region server files. But these lower layers don't know the full context of what's going on, and they shouldn't because that would be a violation of the abstraction. But what that also means is that log messages don't have that context. 
Um, we just have a lot of different log files, of course. As you saw in the earlier diagram, you might easily have hundreds of log files. So, I mean, we have spent much, t a lot of time looking at these things, but really, it's not the best way to do it. At least if you're looking for perform if you if you are looking for performance problems this way, it's going to be difficult. Um, metrics are nice. Metrics are very important. Um, things like uh, how many transactions are you doing per second? Um, how many times are you flushing the wall? Uh, how you know how many bytes did you read and write to disk? These things are nice. Uh, they can help you figure out things like are you really pushing all the disk bandwidth you need? Or you ought to be pushing. Um, are we spiking CPU and so on and so forth? But the problem is they're always aggregates, right? So just be, you know, you could have a great day where you push a lot of requests, but then maybe you have some requests that are really, really slow, and it wasn't a great day for those guys. So metrics are not going to really give you that information uh, by and large. Now you can have other metrics. You can have metrics for like tail request latency, which is nice. But again, it doesn't really help to answer the question, why? Why was it slow? To answer that question, you have to look elsewhere. So the htrace approach is to decompose requests into various trace spans and have all these attributed systems create trace spans while they're performing certain operations. Um, <clears throat> I should stop here and note that we're a little bit different than some of the systems that have been discussed today in that we don't strictly follow the call stack. We don't do system calls or anything like that. We, we require essentially hard trace points um, to be added to the application. And the reason for that is just that um, the volume of data would be overwhelming if we logged every uh, call stack or system call. So that's the reason why we use this particular approach. Um, so trace spans represent a length of time. They have a description, a start time, end time, unique identifier. Um, they also have a process ID and an IP address, um, and potentially other information identifying the node, which is, of course, very helpful. There's also other metadata that can be added. So we have sort of a, uh, a key value uh, escape hatch that you can add to if you need to add more information to trace spans. So trace spans have a parent-child relationship. Um, they form a directed acyclic graph. Um, it is not a tree because trace spans can have multiple parents in each trace, unlike in some other systems. So this would be an example of uh, doing a copy from local operation, where the first thing you do is create a file system and then you are going to be uh, calling get file info. Actually, I left out the part that's actually doing copying here, but this is an example of the kind of thing that you see. So uh, w one thing that's very important to us is sampling. And again, it's because we have a, a huge volume of data, right? We have a huge volume of requests, many, many different nodes, and we really only are interested in getting a picture of what's going on in the cluster, not necessarily in tracing every request. Um, <clears throat> the sampling rate is configurable. We also have the ability to turn on sampling for everything if we want to, um, and obviously turn it off. But to me, sampling is key to some of the goals that we have of being able to run this in production with essentially zero impact. So, HTrace has been around for a while. Yeah. If you're using sampling, mm -hmm. are you going to miss the tail latencies that you so much want to catch? Potentially. So it depends on um, it depends on what the sampling rate is and how many of these tail latencies you have, things like that. Um, our intuition about this comes sort of from the DAPL project, which also used sampling, and was able to get still a significant benefit in um, catching these high latency requests. 
So it's definitely something that, um, like it would be ideal if we could decide after the fact, like these are the traces that we should have had. But the reality is that carrying tracing, activating tracing has an overhead which is measured in bytes sent over the network as well as local resources. So we don't want to activate tracing on everything all the time. So, yeah, and we can talk more about that later. But, so a brief history. Um, Atrace has been around for a while, and it has a really high version of it. But, but we haven't, um, <clears throat> a lot of these earlier releases were proof of concepts. Um, so, we also bumped the version number when we moved to Apache, because we wanted to sort of cleanly delineate the Apache releases from the earlier GitHub releases. Um, we've been doing a lot of stuff lately. It's been very active. We bumped the version number yet again, but for a good reason, because we're trying to maintain a sort of semantic versioning system. So we're, we're breaking backwards compatibility in the versioning, in the, in the API, so therefore we're bumping the version number. And I'll, I can talk a little bit more about the new improvements later. But, uh, so, I mean, I've been talking a little bit about our goals, but let me sort of um, be a little more clear as well about them. We want to be language agnostic and framework agnostic. Like, we don't want to be just a tracer for Java or just a tracer for Scala. Um, we want to support C++, C, um, Java, Scala, all that stuff. C++ is becoming more and more important in distributed systems and C as well. So it's definitely not all Java and Hadoop anymore, in case, in case you were wondering. Um, there are many frameworks, of course. No one can really agree on what framework to use, so we can't just tie ourselves to one framework. We really have to be tracing across everything. Um, and we also want to be able to trace both, li both libraries and applications. So that's one of the goals of our new API rework is to make configuration work a little bit better for, for libraries. Um, some more goals. So HTrace is, a, is modular. Um, it supports multiple ways of storing the trace spans that we generate. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of those ways in just a little bit. Um, obviously, we want the API to be very stable. This is kind of a big concern for us because we're dealing with so many different upstream projects. And we can't just, even if we wanted to, we can't just change the API, even if it would be nice. We have to kind of uh, not, not leave those guys high and dry. Um, being able to be used in production is very important for us. And that's something that we're striving towards right now. Um, and HBase hasn't been used in production in the past, so this is something that will be new, a big advance. Because when you get these kind of performance questions about performance, you really want to be able to look at the past rather than just asking someone, oh, well, set up a test cluster and then, then see. Well, you, you know, setting up a test cluster doesn't tell you whether there were hardware problems on the old cluster or what really was going on. You might never know, unless you can trace in production. So integration is very important to us. So although having hard trace points obviously adds work for us, uh, we feel that it will not add work for our users, because once we are integrated into a bunch of different projects, they should just be able to flip a switch and say, I want tracing. Um, so having hard trace points is nice, I think, for that. So as I said, modularity is very important. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about what our modules really are. So. The most important one, perhaps, is the client library, which comes in two flavors right now. One of them is uh, basically a Java client, and the other is a C client. So uh, the client library is basically responsible for generating traces. Um, it is what the application will be integrating with. Then we have span receivers, which are um, something which takes the spans that were generated by the client library and stores them somewhere. So HTrace HBase stores these spans in HBase, which is a data store, of course. We have an Accumulo data store as well as an HTraceD data store, which is unique to HTrace. 
Another uh, mo module here is the web UI. So we would like the web UI to be shared among all components. We're working on getting that support. Um, the basic idea is the web UI makes it possible to see what's going on and all those nice things. Visualization. Um, it's nice to be modular, and actually I think it's one of the things that sets HTTPS apart from many other tools in this space. So, HTTPS HBase is nice if you already have HBase uh, deployed. If not, then it can be a lot of, you know, it's a lot of work to set up a NoSQL data store, any NoSQL data store. But if you have HBase deployed, this is a very nice way of storing spans. Uh, Accumulo is very similar, except, you know, the Accumulo community instead of HBase. HTRACE-D is the span receiver which is unique to HTRACE. Um, it stores spans in a separate daemon, which uses LevelDB to add its own disk format. The nice thing about HTRACE-D is that it's easy to get started with. So you don't have to set up a whole Accumulo cluster or HBase cluster. You can just sort of go. Um, Obviously, the, the graphical interface is very important to us. Um, and I'll show you a quick demo of that later. But here's sort of a screenshot. And this is kind of similar to some of the GUIs that we've seen today. Um, I would say some of the main differences are the fact that, obviously for us, all, of those, all these different spans can come from different processes. So it's not just, um, it's not just like a plane graph on a, on a single node. The other thing is that because we can have multiple parents, we simply can't just draw a plane graph because that could be a little misleading. Um, I'd also like to note that um, we don't require synchronized clocks to be installed on these clusters. So the times that you see on there are actually times that came from each cluster node. But even if you didn't, even if those times were off, you would still be able to see the parent-child relationships. So for us, the parent-child relationships are somewhat fundamental. And the clocks are just kind of a nice to have. Um, so we've been making a lot of progress recently. Um, some, I guess what might seem mundane here, but actually it's pretty important, more effective error checking. Um, we've also been optimizing our RPC format a bit. I know you guys were talking earlier about uh, formats. We have a JSON format, yes, of course. But we also have an optimized format, which is a message pack format. Um, which is nice because it's very similar to JSON, so we can just sort of flip back and forth between them. Uh, we have been making a lot of progress in integration, and we're making a huge amount of progress on the GUI. So, um, in HTRACE 4.0, which is the coming release, we're enlarging the span IDs. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't talk about how span IDs are assigned. So, in a way that's somewhat similar to Git, I suppose, we use um, a long identifier, which we assume does not collide for our span ID. With Git, you have, of course, a sort of content. You have sort of a SHA-1 hash of the content. With us, it's just a purely random number. Uh, we recently enlarged that number to 128 bits to avoid collisions. Although it might seem like a 64-bit number is large enough to avoid collisions, when you have a really, really large number of spans, um, you start to run into the birthday problem where, or the birthday apparent paradox, whatever you want to call it, where you get collisions more than you would expect, just using these random numbers. Uh, we've been trying to have a better API for clients, so less boilerplate, removing some globals that were causing issues, removing deprecated functions. We would like to have some aggregate views. So I think um, some way of seeing like what the variance is, what the average is of various spans would be very nice. Um, so we'll have to think more about that and how to do that efficiently. 
We also need to integrate the GUI more closely with some of the sub-projects. So here's some example code. Um, it's pretty simple. This is a Java example. So <clears throat> the idea is, um, you know, these scopes are basically created usually using a try-catch metaphor or a try-filing metaphor, actually. We also have APIs for detaching spans from a thread and attaching them to another thread. So you can do cross-thread synchronization stuff with htrace. Um, we have a great community with a lot of contributors from different companies. We've been doing uh, a bunch of releases in the last few months. We just released, well, I guess we didn't just release. Uh, a few months ago, we released 3.2.0, and we are working on 4.0 now. Um, we've been sharing a lot of ideas with the Hadoop community, but we're also looking for ideas from all the big data and distributed systems communities. And we want to uh, you know, be as useful as we can, obviously. So, yeah, I mean, the targets for 4.x, which I talked about a little bit earlier, but we really want to have end-to-end -end tracing for all of Hadoop. So, <clears throat> you know, ideally, in any component of Hadoop, you would be able to figure out if you're having a performance problem, why are you having it? How can you fix it? Uh, when did it start? That sort of thing. Um, we also would like to improve our C and C++ support. That's going to be a big goal in the 4.x line, I think, because that support is very new right now. Hasn't been tested very much. So we're coming up on a release, which is going to be very nice, I think. Uh, it'll be the first release where non-developers can kind of play with this and actually, I think, have a pretty good experience. Um, for a long time, HTrace was kind of a tool that we would use internally to diagnose issues. But we'd also like to make it usable so that you don't have to kind of hack the code yourself to, to do it. And Clutter is going to be releasing this as a beta project, or a Clutter Labs project, which basically means that it will be available for people who want to install it as an add-on. And we're going to be officially packaging it, stuff like that. So all that good stuff. Um, I should also talk about a few similar projects. So Dapper is, you know, one of the older projects that inspired a lot of people in this space. Dapper is something Google did to basically do the same kind of end-to-end -end tracing. Um, Zipkin is also kind of similar-ish. Zipkin is different in that it is written in Scala, and it's pretty tightly tied to the Finagle RPC framework. So if you're not using Finagle, you're probably not too interested in it. Although recently they've been trying to, to change that. Um, Xtrace was an academic project exploring some ideas in, uh, in distributed tracing. And one thing that it, that's different in Xtrace from these projects is that um, Xtrace supports the concept of multiple parents for each child span, whereas these projects did not. So it can be difficult to represent something like um, if you are flushing a write-ahead log, um, it can be difficult to determine who the parent should be of that flush. Because really, typically you're doing group commit, and when you flush a write-ahead log, you're flushing multiple transactions. So, yeah. Um, I'm going to give a demo here, if the demo gods are being kind. Uh, so, let me see if I can find this. Oh, one sec.
So let's do a demo of uh, making a request and sort of seeing it show up in HTrace. Um, so we should have no um, have no spans at the beginning. Yes. And we should copy, basically just copy a file to HDFS, something really simple. Okay, well, we have to wait for a second. <clears throat> so, what I've done here is I've generated a ton of load on, uh, on one of the cluster nodes here. Let me see if I can enlarge this a little bit. Maybe not. So I've got a script running here which is generating a huge amount of load on this particular cluster node. Disk load, that is. Um, you can see that the write megabytes per second is very high. So this is going to result in you know, a pretty slow write here. Okay, so let's take a look. So, So I'm looking for slow data nodes here. And let's see if I can find them. Ah, here we go. OK. So one thing that you can see here is that actually I don't think it used the slow node. I've got four of them. Let's try again on this. Try one more time. Yeah. Let's restart. So that we've got clean slate here. Oh, do not have a clean slate. All right, so I've got some old data on here that's kind of making it hard to see. But one thing that you can see here um, is that you can definitely sort of drill down and really see what's going on. Like, you can see um, what each data node is doing. Not in this trace, but that was a trace where the data node is down. But Like, you can see that in this copy from local, just creating the final system is taking a pretty large amount of time. That was something that surprised me when I first uh, discovered it. You can also drill down a little bit more, and you can see that um, in this particular trace, most of the time is not actually being spent copying. Most of the time is spent on other stuff. So... 
see if I can find this. Yeah, see, this trace is missing name node info, but uh, all right. Yeah, see, sometimes even when the name node doesn't take a very long time, the RPC can still take a while. Anyway, um, <clears throat> yeah, let me. Let me go into more detail about this later offline with people who are interested. But that's sort of an overview of what you can do with the GUI. And it's definitely improved a lot over the last few uh, months. So I guess it should take questions now. Um, you said that the, the parent-child relationship between these different spans was more important than clocks. How, how do you identify uh, this relationship between the different parts of the request? Good question. So the parent, uh, the parent-child relationship is specified by the API, basically. Uh, we pass the parent ID over the wire when we're doing RPCs. So if I'm doing an RPC, I'll be passing the parent ID and when you create your span, you'll say, by the way, that was my parent. And this is managed by thread local uh, variables. What about the cases, as you outlined, that have multiple parents? Then we have to pass multiple parents over the wire. But actually, um, in every case that exists right now, we don't need to pass multiple parents over the wire because um, How do I describe it? Um, it's it's all right to have multiple parents in only one or two places in the graph. You don't need to have it everywhere, right? Um, typically, yeah. I guess one place where how do I describe it? Like if you have if you have a node that you know, my node can have a, a single parent, and that single parent can have multiple parents. So right now, we haven't found it necessary to pass multiple parents in the same RPC. But maybe we will at some point. And going back to the sampling, uh, if, if you're sampling, how do you not lose certain levels or layers of a request? Like, how can you make sure you get the whole request? That's a good question. Actually, maybe I should have been more clear on this. Um, when we, we want to sample an entire request, start to end. We don't want to do sampling within a request. We want to do sampling at the start of a request. At the start of the request, we should say we're doing all of it or we're doing none of it. That's the goal. Other questions? All right. Thank you. All right.